Welcome to another webinar in the Ed Tech or Educational Technology for All webinar series presented by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Educational Technology and the Office of Special Education Programs. We are really excited to share with you today about STEMI. So let's get started. First, I wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We're really excited to share um, STEMI with you all from the perspectives of the co-director, the leads of their accessibility and app features, and a family member who uses the tool. Please be aware that you can turn on the closed captioning features by finding the CC button on your screen. You should also be able to see an American Sign Language interpreter on your screen, and you can share questions during the webinar using the Q&A feature. We will save the questions and answers, um, a question and answer questions from the audience at the end of the webinar. So next I wanna pass the mic to Anita. Hello everyone. So I wanna start with why we're here today. Cause when we talk to the educators and caregivers who work with young children, we hear some of these quotes. All children, whether they have a developmental delay or not deserve the opportunity to develop STEM right from instance, develop STEM right learning right from infancy. Children with special rights and needs are competent and capable of learning alongside their peers in the areas of math, science, engineering, and technology. The work of developing STEM or STEAM curriculum with differentiation is the forefront of my teaching practice. So the reason why we have put together these webinars is because with that in mind is we want to equip educators and school leaders and other practitioners of early childhood educators and all kinds of teachers with evidence-based ed tech tools to implement with those students or children who do not have disabilities um, that have the goal of improving our student outcomes. So a couple of terms that we're gonna be using or we do use in our, our world of technology is educational technology known as ed tech, which is any technology used for purposes of learning and accessibility, which is the design of apps, devices, materials, and environments that support and enable access to content and educational activities for all learners. Educational materials and technologies are accessible to people with disabilities if they are able to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as people who do not have disabilities. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, so Anita and I are excited to present on behalf of the Department of Education. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Jessica Chung. I use she, her pronouns. I am an Education Pioneers Impact Fellow at the Office of Educational Technology, or OET. I am an Asian American woman with straight black hair. Um, I'm in front of a backdrop that says Office of Educational Technology. Um, I previously worked in higher education access and admissions. Currently, I support OET projects on digital equity and open licensing. OET's mission, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, is to develop national educational technology policy and establish the vision for how technology can be used to transform teaching and learning and make everywhere all the time learning possible for early education, K-12, higher education, and adult education. Thanks, Jessica. So my name is Anita, and I'm from the Office of Special Education Programs. And I'm described as a white female with long blonde hair. And I've spent most of my career working as a teacher, a coach, technology specialist, and district administrator. So currently, I support a lot of projects in this office. And we are dedicated to improving results for infants, toddlers, children, and youth with disability ages birth through 21. OSEP directly and through its partners and grantees develops a whole range of research-based products, publications, and resources to assist states, local district personnel, and families 
to improve results for children and students with disabilities. And so now I'd like to turn the introductions over to our panelists, which we are very excited to have with us today. So I'm going to turn it over to Megan, Wendy, and Tony. Thanks so much, Anita. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Megan Bin, and I'm the co-director of STEMI. And I'm very excited to be here. Um, if I'm and if I'm following the introductions, I am a white female wearing my pink headphones. Um, I have a blurred background, so you can't see the mess behind me. Um, and I'm very excited to be here today to share a little bit about what we do at STEMI. Um, and I'm going to pass it now to Wendy. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Sapp. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a white woman with long gray hair that used to be brown, so you might see a little bit of brown still in it. Um, I'm sitting in my at my home office with some bookshelves behind me with books and a braille writer and some other miscellaneous things. Um, I am delighted to be here with you guys today. I am Senior Project Director for Bridge Multimedia, uh, which has several accessibility apps through uh, OSEP. And as part of that, I'm also the, the lead on the STEMI app project that we have worked on jointly and that we'll be talking about today. Tony? Thanks, Wendy. Hello, everyone. My name is Tony Miguel. I am a white woman with long dark blonde hair that's pulled back in a ponytail and I'm wearing my black headphones and a lavender shirt. I am currently a technical assistance provider for early intervention programs that's birth to age five in Pennsylvania. I'm also the parent of two children who received early intervention services and have used STEMI resources. Thank you. We're very excited to have you all with us today um, and to hear from this panel. You all bring such a great variety of perspectives. And so I'm going to start with asking the first question with Megan. So Megan, uh, can you tell us what is STEMI and what do you offer to educators and families? Yeah, thanks, Anita. Um, I, so STEMI, or it's really the STEM Innovation for Inclusion and Early Education Center, or STEMI, um, and I know you talked about this a little bit in your introduction, Anita, but um, I think what's really important is that our big charge at STEMI is to ensure that there are um, resources, that we're really developing the knowledge, that we're providing support to um, educators, families, institutes of higher education to ensure that young children with disabilities um, have the opportunity to engage in STEM um, and that they're engaging um, and that they're provided with high quality opportunities to engage and really be part of inclusive STEM opportunities um, as well. And at STEMI, we have really, and I know we're going to talk a bit about this as we go on, but um, we've developed resources and we're going to share a bunch of those with you today because I think we have a lot that is available for practitioners, educators, families. Um, we also work with institutes of higher education to really support this goal of making sure that everyone has a positive STEM identity and sees themselves as being part of STEM. And I think Anita, I'll stop there since we're gonna share a whole bunch more as we go through on the resources that we have available. Um, oh, I also wanted to share, uh, and this is the big one that we have at STEMI. Um, and I should have shared this earlier, but one of the things that's really important is at STEMI, we are working, um, if you click one more time, thank you. So we see STEM or inclusive STEM, particularly or at STEMI, we believe this is a marriage between inclusion and STEM, right? So we need to have making sure that we're thinking about what does STEM really look like? Um, we're focused birth to five. So really focusing on what does STEM look like for infants and toddlers? What does STEM look like for preschoolers? Um, and we're gonna talk more about that. And I'm really excited that Tony and Wendy are able to join me because I know Tony, you're gonna talk a little bit about this from your experience. Um, what does this look like as well in, in your home? But we at STEMI have been working on um, what's called learning trajectories. And learning trajectories is a three part um, process, which is there is a goal. And the goal is really, what is your big idea? What is the the science, technology, 
engineering or math goal or what is the maybe cross cutting concepts. And then we also have a developmental progression. So which means that for each goal, there is a what is the way that children's thinking um, how are children thinking about STEM? How can we support children in moving along that progression? I want to be clear, it's not a linear path. It really is a strengths-based approach to ensure that we're starting wherever a child is. Um, and then a key part is that adults do something to facilitate STEM activities within daily routines and environments. So we're really thinking about where children are and how can we support them in moving forward. But that requires that there's adult practices. Perhaps there are um, facilitating learning, I'm teaching. Um, also thinking about though, the key part is that we're thinking about inclusion and that the whole time I'm thinking about these instructional tasks as how can I think about what do I need to do in the environment activities and routines to ensure that all children can engage? What do I need to do um, to my materials? Do I need to make adaptations? Um, are there assistive devices that might be useful? What do I need to do to make sure the materials are accessible? And then also maybe I need to change my instruction. So at STEMI, these are, as, we, as we're gonna be talking about the resources and other supports um, that we offer, this is really our center is how do we ensure that we're really being strengths-based, not trying to change children and families to engage in STEM, but to change what we're doing to make sure that all children, um, that we're reducing any barriers to that participation and engagement. Oh, look at that. I had one more little uh, technology thing. Okay. Thank you so much, Megan. This is Jessica. Um, so I have, I have another question for Megan and Tony. Why is STEM important for young children, including infants and toddlers? Yeah, um, I'll start and then Tony, I know you're gonna um, jump in as well. And to just start, I wanted to really share that we know, and I know Anita, you said this in the opening, that STEM starts in infancy. This is also how children engage with the world. They're exploring their environments, they're learning, and it's about what do we do as adults to make it maybe more intentionally connected to STEM. Um, but this really taps into children's natural curiosity. Um, and so I think to illustrate why it's important, we're gonna show an example. Um, and so if you wanna go to the next one, we're gonna share a quick video um, about Tony. Um, this is Tony and her son Kingston, but really about thinking about how STEM has both supported um, some, some goals that maybe the family has, but also thinking about how it has really connected to some IEP goals, IFSP goals that um, Kingston had re related to thinking about problem solving and persistence. And so we're going to share this video and then Tony um, is going to share a little bit more from her perspective on how STEM, how STEM is really important for infants and toddlers. Kingston. Kingston is a three-year-old boy who lives with his mom, dad, and older sister. When Kingston was 20 months old, his parents noticed a delay in communication and had him evaluated with the local early intervention program. Kingston's communication delay was confirmed and he received speech language therapy and made significant progress in communication. His parents and teachers want to encourage Kingston to develop persistence, problem solving skills, and more complex language and vocabulary. Kingston's parents decided to use his love of ramps to investigate the concepts of force and motion to help develop his problem solving and communication skills. They also used adaptations to support his play and engagement. How can we make this ball roll faster, you think? Hmm. What can we use? Um. Can we make a ramp? <gasps> yes! A yes? Show me. How could you make a ramp? Note the progression Kingston and his mom work on as part of the learning trajectories in forces and motion. Oh, it's not rolling. Hmm? Oh, you have to push it. How can we make it roll without pushing? Oh. Okay, let's see how fast. Whoa, that was really fast. Big fast me. How can we make Big fast me. How can we make it go slower? It's slower. What should we do to make Kingston's mom continues to scaffold and guide different ways of setting up ramps. 
This one will make it very slow. This one will make it very slow? Yeah, because you have to do two. This. Oh, a little bit slower. Yeah, they have a Do you think this cow will fit down the brick? Will it roll? Uh, maybe not. Why? The teeth. Oh. It doesn't roll. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, because it can't, because it don't have to um, a roll off into this. Oh, it's not round like the ball? Yeah. It has red sides and it has um, both teeth. Kingston then expands his understanding of the motion of objects. Cows don't roll because they aren't round, but balls do because they are round like wheels. What else did you notice Kingston thinking and doing? Stay updated on our progress. So this is Tony. I just wanted to make sure the video didn't start again. Um, so you saw there my son um, talking about force and motion. And just to answer why I thought it's so important to think about STEM concepts for my young children, I just really, like Megan said, I want to echo, little kids are like little scientists, and it's really only natural for them to embed STEM concepts into their everyday activities and routines. Like you could even see in the video, I wanted him to ask, answer the question about why the cow was going to go down the ramp without even trying it. But he's like, let's see, let's try. So it's just natural for little kids to want to, to put those scientific principles into their everyday actions. Um, we also know that providing access to STEM education from that early age really helps ensure that all children have equal opportunities to develop skills needed for future success. So when I think about my two children who both received early intervention um, for different reasons, I want to make sure that they're still receiving the same opportunities that children, that their peers are receiving in um, their early childhood experiences. So for example, with my daughter, who you didn't see in the video, but she has cochlear implants. So she was exposed from a very young age to complex and essential engineering and technology. With, with that amplification technology. So it's really not an option for our family to ignore STEM learning because it's so important to the learning and development of our children. Kingston. That video was great and that extra information. Thank you so much. So uh, this is Anita speaking. Uh, so I'm curious if uh, Megan and Tony, if you guys could share a little bit more about now that we see how powerful it is, what are some of the resources that support the inclusion of STEM? Thanks. Um, yeah, if you go to the, yeah, I see you're gonna click the next one. So um, at SEMI, we have actually a lot of resources and we've pulled a few that we thought were really important um, and hope we'll put it in the um, chat as well. Hope you'll look at our website. Um, but I think some of the big ones that we have is we've really put together some things because like Tony said, we know that children are you know little scientists or little engineers, or they're really starting with that natural curiosity. So some of it is about what do we do as adults to be more intentional? And so I think you'll see that we have at STEMI like a guide to noticing STEM learning. Um, one of the things as we were working with teachers and practitioners that we were learning, uh, we have what we call incubators um, where we're trying some things out. But one of the things we were learning is how sometimes there's a fear of how do we respond to children when they have maybe noticed something and there's sort of a um, natural teaching opportunity and so we have this guide to noticing which i think helps us to recognize how do we either um and also this guide to asking open-ended questions how do we question um we may not need to know the exact answer about why a STEM phenomena is happening, but how do we really support a child's development in asking open-ended questions or noticing and narrating what they're seeing? And so we have some guides on that. Um, for example, in one of our incubators, we had a young child who was really interested. There was a balloon and he was really interested in static. And we heard from the practitioner that she was wondering, well, I don't really know why a balloon sticks to his clothing. 
Um, and we were saying, well, maybe you don't need to know. The, the point is to really ask some of these questions and say, will this balloon stick to the wall? Let's try it. And I think you saw Tony and Kingston doing that when they were trying different objects down the ramp. Um, we also have a guide to sort of teaching practices, which really thinks about that continuum of strategies. Um, again, in early childhood, like many of you know, we're doing playful learning um, and learning through play and really thinking about what are those natural routines and activities that things are happening. And so it's really important for us to have some strategies that we're using that are really maintaining and really thoughtfully thinking about play and routines and activities. And so you'll find some other things on our website too about incorporating STEM into what you're already doing within your routines and activities. And then also we have our guide to adaptations, which really focuses on how do you make those adaptations? How do I think about environments, materials, and, um, and that instruction from the beginning? So that I'm proactively thinking about inclusion and that it isn't an add-on, but it is just the way we are within our classroom. And then I think, Tony, you may have some things you want to add as well about some of these resources. Yes, thanks, Megan. So this is Tony again. When I was first looking at um, the STEMI resources, as it was more in STEMI's infancy, Kingston's now going to kindergarten next week. <laughs> But I really liked looking at the resources because it helped me as a mom look at my children's play and see where they are now and what might be expected next and activities to support that. And like Megan said, it wasn't necessarily a linear process, but I could sort of see where it fits in in, in the grand scheme because I don't always know what the progression is for different STEM concepts. Um, what I really love about STEMI resources is that, that they're really based in the science of these learning trajectories, but they always add in adaptations and considerations to support my child with the different kinds of things they might need to be successful with those concepts. Um, I really like the discovery play activities are great for that. Um, and even since I looked at the STEMI website last time, there's so many more. So there's really lots of ideas out there. And another great thing about the STEMI resources is that they've always considered equity when designing activities. So as you saw in that video, I used sort of things that I grabbed from around my playroom that I just had. I didn't have to go out and buy anything. It was just things that I could have used at any time. For example, I used a track that he had from his cars because he loves cars. But other times we played this and I just grab an old Amazon box that's been broken down and put it on the side of the coffee table and we just drive his cars down like that. So it's really easy to implement these ideas. I don't have to have special materials, special resources. And now that the um, STEMI resources are right there that show me you know, what questions to ask, what kinds of um, vocabulary or words I might wanna use, that really helps me as a parent in designing that kind of play for my child. Thanks, Tony. And I love that you said STEM doesn't have to be expensive, right? That's, right. you know, I think sometimes we think we need toys, but um, I love that you're saying you just use what you have to really engage your child in, in the STEM learning. This is Jessica speaking. Thank you both so much for the overview of STEMI's resources. Um, and I think what I, one thing that I love about the examples that you're using is um, how you are able to integrate STEM teaching and learning into your everyday activities and seeing so many opportunities to teach and learn about STEM um, in everyday activities. So sort of continuing along that, that um, thread, what are some resources that encourage STEM learning at home and in centers during those everyday routines and activities? Yeah, thanks, Jessica. And I think that's one of our, um, especially at SEMI, one of our critical things, right, is we know learning doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Children are learning all the time. Um, and that we know that in centers and homes, there are everyday routines and activities that are that are happening all the time. Um, and so STEM is a great 
what you, know, you can incorporate STEM into pretty much anything. You know, we have some resources that talk about at home, how do you incorporate STEM into maybe when you're um, getting dressed in the morning? That's a great time for computational thinking because things go on first before other things then go on. So, um, or during mealtime. But um, if you go to the next one, one of the things that we have that I think is really important is we know in classrooms um, and at homes often, or often we may have access to storybook resources, right? We have usually in a center, there are books or things that you're using. And so one of the things we've tried to do is also say, how does STEM connect to what you're already doing? So we have these storybook resources um, that are a great way to start. And we've done this for quite a few books and also sort of tried to show an approach to really connecting STEM with um, dialogic reading and really thinking about how you're reading books to really get at some of those STEM concepts. And so you can see here, this is an example of one of them where we've looked at The Hike, which is a book um, about a hike <laughs> um, that's written by Alison Farrell. Um, and it's really about three curious young explorers. And so in it, what we've done is tried to show, you know, perhaps what, what age the book is for, and then also really how might you do some of that questioning and dialogic reading while you're reading the book. Um, and so it's sort of, you can print out the bookmark if you want to, or you can use these, um, but this is a way that we've tried to also show um, we have also some series, and we'll put those in the chat as well, on what families can do at home also during their routines and activities, but we thought this was one way to really think about how can you connect STEM to what you're already doing related to stories. And I know, Tony, you've been using this in some of your classes um, with some of the students that you're teaching to become future teachers, and so wanted to turn it over to you to share a little bit about how you're doing that. Thanks, Megan. This is Tony again. So yes, I do have the privilege of teaching some higher education classes for our early future early childhood workforce. And I also work with other faculty who redesign some of their courses to consider equity and inclusion. And the STEMI bookmarks really have been a powerful launching point for these early childhood teacher education students to think about how they can support STEM learning during read alouds. So STEMI has many on their website, but as we all know, there are millions of children books out there. So it's really cool that we have the students put together their own bookmark for a, another book that, that looks at these kinds of STEMI concepts using the dialogic reading uh, crowd prompts. Um, it's really nice for teachers and for families that, that they can have these sort of easily accessible resources that support STEM learning in that approachable, but still robust way. So I just foresee our future early childhood teachers, you know, all the teachers have sort of their own read aloud books in their corner, just having all their STEM bookmarks for each of those so that they just right away are equipped to read aloud a book in a way that's research and evidence-based to support STEM learning. Thanks, Tony. And as you were talking, I also wanted to share that I think we've tried to curate STEM book lists to make sure that we are thinking about um, books that showcase a disabled protagonist or um, Black or uh, Latin protagonist. So really trying to be thoughtful about sharing with you some books that might be useful within your catalog. Um, I don't know if catalog's the right word, but within what you're doing <laughs> um, to really connect STEM um, and reading. And, and really be thinking about how that works within your day. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway is that STEM doesn't always have to be an add-on. It can be, I mean, it is an add-on in some cases, right? There are certain times of the day where we're doing that, but also hopefully we're connecting all of our learning to really have a whole child approach. Um, and I appreciated James in the Q&A where you talked about that uh, learning some of these things, experimenting, observing, and observing as important skills for young children, especially young children with disabilities to learn. So we appreciate the continued feedback and questions that are coming in as well. That's great. You guys have so, this is Anita speaking. You guys have so many great resources on there, on your website that you've shared so far that support in, I call, you call it STEM learning, but when you think about that, it's problem solving and critical thinking. It's like those early, also early technology type of skills and all those kinds of things that are so important for young children to start experiencing. 
Uh, and so now uh, we're going to turn it over to Wendy, actually. We're really excited about an uh, accessible app that you guys have developed to integrate with your uh, STEM resources. So Wendy, can you tell us more about this app? I absolutely can. And I'm going to ask you to go back one slide while I start talking, uh, because I want everybody to have a chance to look at that um, QR code. Um, and we're also going to put the link in the chat at some point during today's session uh, so that you guys can all get this app. It's completely for free. It's on the App Store. It's on Google Play. And it's something that uh, that STEMI working with Bridge Multimedia, the company that I work for, have developed. So now if we'll go forward two slides. Um, this app is just a really fun way for families to explore STEM. So just like you saw the wonderful example that we had of, um, of um, I'm sorry, I'm just drawing a blank. I'm so sorry, Tony and her son working on a ramp. This is this app is intended to guide children through doing those sorts of adventures with their family. So it's intended for families to do together. A teacher could do it with the children as well. Um, one of the cool things we like about this is the very first thing it does, the first time you open it up, is it walks you through making it accessible for the child and the family. So let's go on to the next slide. This, it starts off and we have Leela Diaz, who's our little character, who starts us off. She invites everybody to come and explore with her. You click on the next button. And, and it says, we want to make sure these tools are set up just like you like them. And when you go from that page, it takes you straight into the settings button. And you can adjust the captions. You can turn them on and off. You can change whether it's a dark caption on a light background or a white caption on a dark background. You can adjust the size um, and set up those captions just the way it's gonna work for your child or for the parent if the parent needs that accessibility. Then you can pick out the sounds. Do you want the volume turned all the way up, way down? Do you want the sound off? Some kids don't like the sound. They would rather have their parent talk them through it. We also have a feature when there are parts of the app that are just for adults. It's by default, it is turned off because our testing told us most parents didn't like that, that reading to them. But if you have a parent who can't read, then they can turn that on. And then the app can read all the parent content to them as well. Um, so you keep going and you have the option to turn the background art off. It's not a huge difference, but it helps just simplify the, the background a little bit for those kids who are so easily distracted. Uh, and then we actually have switch access for kids who use switches to access things. This would uh, require them using a device that is able to connect to their mobile device using this, an iPad or other tablet. Uh, but if they have that, then they're able to use that switch access to move through the app on their own. Um, so they can go back at any point in time by clicking on the little settings button at the top adjust any of these things, and they can also adjust the language. Um, at this point, we have English and Spanish. And so if you click on the language option, you can choose English, Espanol. And if you do that, then everything gets switched over into Spanish and you can adjust what you're doing um, and make it convenient for you. And then the whole thing uh, the, on the screen, the audio, everything is in Spanish. And at this point it says, hey, let's go on our adventure now. I'm gonna switch us back into English um, and we get our little intro. We're gonna explore science, technology, engineering, and math. We keep going. And then after going through this adventure, after having a little interaction like Tony did with her son, everything they do, they're taking pictures of and it turns it into a book that they can go back and read anytime they want to. We have advice for grownups. So there's a little question mark icon that comes up on some pages and it gives some of those hints that are in those STEMI resources. Some of those techniques that Tony modeled with her son of things that they can do to help their kid learn. 
Um, and then they can choose their adventure. We have 10 books. We have a lot of compare and contrast items like big and small, living and non-living things. We have making patterns. Uh, we have things like sequencing things like snack time to make a snack. Go ahead and move ahead one. Um, and we also have one called Ramp It Up. Does that remind you of what Tony did with her son? You have things about pushing and pulling. So families can choose whatever book is going to interest their kid. They're also available in Spanish, as I said. Wendy, this is Anita. I just have a question. Can you reiterate then? So it sounds like this is a really useful app for the child to use with the parent or the parent or caregiver to use with the child. It's not an app where you hand it over to a child and it doesn't sound like an app where you just have the adult do it on their own. Is that right? Can you exactly. This is intended for the, the child and the parents or their caregivers to do together. It's intended to really encourage that interaction between them. And that's some of the feedback we've gotten from families when they use these apps. They're like, my kid loves it, but I love it because now I know what to do. I remember a parent of one child who is totally blind and I was like, are they even going to like this app because he's not getting the whole pictures out, out of it and taking photos of things. And the mom was like, this was great because now I know how to teach my kid to compare things and to look at things that are big and little or rough and smooth. Um, so it's really helpful for the families and the children to do this together. And that's really the only way it's intended to work. Wonderful. Sounds very inclusive. Thank you. Keep going. This is great. Yes, let's move ahead. Um, so when in this case, we, we're pretending that the families picked big and small and the parents are told, here's what the kid's going to be learning as they do this. They can read it. They can have it read to them. And then they flip on into the story. Um, okay. Again, we have our Spanish version. Um, so the story starts and they want to find three things in this case that are bigger than they are. So they go through and they'll open up the camera on their phone or their tablet. And when they do, they'll get to find something that's big. That little question mark at the bottom gives parents ideas of, you know, maybe choose something that's bigger than your child. Um, that might be a, a way to have that comparison for them. It might give them cues about words to use. You could use huge, gigantic, large, ginormous, um, all of these different tech terms they could use. So they go in and they take a picture. In this case, this wasn't a big picture. This was a small picture. Um, but if they like this picture, they can say, yes, they like it. Or they can retake the picture. And they can say, we found a small flower. And they get to put in that word. They can either use the keyboard or they can use voice input, uh, such as down there at the bottom. They can just go into the microphone aspect. So the kids themselves can add that, those words if they want to. Um, and then it's dropped into the story for them. It says, we found a small flower. They keep going through. They go through, they pick their three small things, their three big things. Um, and then Leela says, what a great job you did. You learned all about big and small. And now they get to read the book that they made. And so that whole book has been, con all everything they did, all the pictures they took, all the words they put in, have been converted into a book. So um, there are two ways that they can read the book. One is at the, the top icon, it tells you, hey, you can click up here and the parents can record reading this book. So they can read the whole story so the kid can go back and listen to it on their own if they want. Let's keep going. So then we have our story. My adventure of, in this case, living and non-living things. It was written by Lynn and Brian. And then they go through the story. Uh, Lynn and Brian went on an adventure with Layla, our guide through the story, and learned about living and non-living things. And so they learned about a living pumpkin. Then they found a living bush. And so on. And so you see how it talks them through the whole story. So let's keep going through this. And they look for non-living things. And we keep going. They found rocks. And they found... Uh, a sidewalk, and they found a bicycle. And then it wraps up with, we learned so many living and non-living things in, the, in our world. And so they have this book that they can go back to anytime they want on the app, 
And if their parent's not with them, they can still listen to it. Uh, if their parent is with them, they could read it to them. So let's go on to the next slide. That just wraps up um, the end of the book. Um, and then afterwards it goes back. They can click on explore and look at more storybooks uh, or no more adventures. Um, or they can go to my storybooks and look at all the stories they've written before. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, in this case, they just written one storybook. So we just have big and small in here. Uh, but as they write more books, they'll get all these different stories. And let's say they wanna do the same story over again. They can have as many as, um, as they want and it just puts them by date. So they can have, have lots of different storybooks in here. Um, so this is our um, our app, and it's we're really excited about it, and really like um, what kids are getting out of it as they're moving through this. We've gotten really good feedback from the families, and um, the response that we've got as we we tested this as we went through. So I'm hoping that you'll take the opportunity to um, explore it. This is Anita. Thank you so much, Wendy. That app looks like so useful. I bet even though it's designed for infants and toddlers and preschoolers, I guess I should say toddlers and preschoolers, um, I bet you even like children in that age of five through seven would still love to do it. It still sounds like it's very applicable to what's in the world around them. I will say we have had quite a few older siblings and children of some of the people on our team who who've tried it out who have loved it. I remember one person came back and said, you know, my seven-year-old came back to me and said, can, can I have your phone? I want to play that game where I get to take pictures. Um, so I would say really up to seven, maybe even eight. And some of the concepts, like one of them is on developing a hypothesis. So some of them are a little bit higher level, um, level skill that a range of ages can participate in. I think that's great. You even talked about how it's two, two children could do it together. I could even picture, like you said, the siblings, like a four and a seven-year-old doing it. You know, sometimes parents are a little distracted and busy at home and you can still promote STEM learning and all this in a very simple way. And um, what was some of the feedback uh, you got from parent, other additional feedback you got that was exciting and you could share today? Yeah, I would say some of the feedback that I really enjoyed hearing were from parents who said, yeah, this, I love that I'm doing something with my child and that my child is doing something. They're not just tapping the screen to, to see things on the screen. They're really interacting with the world. Um, and this app, it's intended for everybody. It's to be accessible for kids with disabilities, but it's really for all kids. Um, and there were just some little things that we put in with universal design, such as, um, like the background to be able to clear it up, keeping it very simple and clear that a lot of parents loved. They liked that it wasn't so busy, it wasn't so loud, there wasn't constant music behind it, uh, which makes it better for some of our kids who need that simpler environment, that cleaner environment. But a lot of the kid, parents of typically developing kids thanked us for that. They were like, I'm so glad that the, the app is like this. This is, is better for my kid. That's great. I can definitely see it something that parents would enjoy. And I know we talk a lot in technology world about the difference between passive technology use and active technology use. And it sounds like this is a very active technology use because it gets them thinking and engaging with other people in the world, not just clicking a bunch of buttons. So um, this is the time now that we have for some questions and answers from the audience. We can address some that were in the chat, but we really invite you uh, to please use the question and answer feature in the chat. Um, I, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see it, and you can ask questions of any of our panelists today. And Anita, while um, folks are doing that and we're checking the q and I wanted to share as well that um, there are also on our website, um, I think I post, we posted a link for you in the chat. There is a way to stay connected with us and it's on our homepage where you can go down and put in your email address and stay connected with STEMI and get updates in our monthly newsletter if you're interested. And so I thought that might be a question and just wanted to make sure that we put it up there that there are 
a variety of ways to engage with us, but that's one where you'll get um, sort of regular updates about STEMI. Um, I think we sent the app out there. And um, so, yeah, I think that's great. And I'm gonna, I see, Wendy, you're answering that question about the QR code. And I was wondering, Jessica, if you might just scroll back to the QR code so folks could um, scan it if they want to. And I think they just posted in the chat the link to the My STEM Adventure page on the STEMI site, but I'll also drop that. And if people are watching this at a later date, like on YouTube and such, the links will be in the descriptions on the YouTube or on the webpage. That is the tech.ed.gov slash accessibility also. And I, I see Jeanette, your question, which I know is more of a um, question or I think a thought for some next steps for OET, which I appreciate on AI and how it can be utilized. But I know, Wendy, we've had conversations about, um, and not saying that this is something that's going to happen, but we've had conversations about how AI could have been a really helpful tool as we were developing my STEM adventure um, and thinking about how to make sure that it's really accessible. So Jeanette, I was just commenting or thinking about your question in the chat for OET as maybe some next steps. But we see this as also thinking about um, at STEMI, we're in the beginning stages of thinking about how we could utilize AI to ensure that things are really accessible for children with disabilities. And I don't know, Wendy, if you wanted to add to that, but I know we've been part of some similar conversations. Right, I know at Bridge Multimedia, we do accessibility across different types of media um, from printed books to broadcast television, to conferences, to apps like this. And one of the things we're constantly looking at is how do we use AI to improve the experience for people because you can have a, an avatar of a signer and it's not the quality that we need, especially not for young children. You can have a synthetic voice reading your audio description. And in some situations that may be okay, but in a lot of them, that's not the quality we want because like we had in that initial description of what accessibility means, it means the same experience, the same enjoyment of it. So there's a, but at the same time, there are a lot of ways we can use AI to you know, help someone who maybe they have a motor difficulty in typing something in and they can use that. Um, in essence, using the voice controls to put things into the app is AI because it is using voice recognition and learning to recognize your voice. We don't think of that as AI, but it really is. Um, so there are uh, other ways that AI can be incorporated into um, to learning, but it is you know, it's something that we want to do right and we want to do it well as we do it. For those watching, uh, the uh, off, uh, Jessica's Office of Educational Technology has released some guidance around AI in education. So if you are looking at how to use it with um, children in schools, uh, that guidance um, is pretty helpful. And I really appreciate your answers, uh, Wendy, to think about how important it is to ultimately the authenticity with children and people, right, is, is what really counts. And that's technology too. It's not just the technology, it's the people behind it. And all of your resources definitely are so connected to that, giving hand, hands-on or environmental experiences for children. I'm wondering if you have any ideas or some suggestions or tips on things that might be coming or ways, activities and ideas that might be coming if people subscribe, like what might a future uh, newsletter and things like might include? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think, well, one of the things that I know that is coming, I talked early on about the learning trajectories approach and we're working on um, a website um, and it will it will connect to the STEMI website, but it is gonna be showcasing all of the trajectories that we've put together. Um, so like you saw Tony working with Kingston on Force in Motion, uh, we have a, a we have a learning trajectory on that with progressions and different activities, and also some videos that showcase um, how children are doing this, how they're thinking about STEM, and also how they're engaging with the activity. So that will be coming, and you'll be getting information when that's released as well. 
Um, we also will be um, sending some, we also will be putting up, we continue to develop materials. We're working on some early intervention materials to really support practitioners in coaching and working with families in the home on um, utilizing the learning trajectories as well. Um, I do think it's exciting to say that we have been, um, we were just awarded STEMI 2.0, so we have another five years of funding. Um, and so we will, there will be a lot to come um, within that. And I think in the next iteration, we're really focusing also on um, how we can make sure we're inclusive and really thinking about that um, identity affirming, like we said early on, or I think, um, I can't remember who said it, but we said it early on, we are excluding a lot of children from STEM and it's starting early. And so how can we make sure that we're really thinking about inclusive and equitable practice proactively? So I think there will be a lot to come. And like, um, and I don't know, Wendy, if you wanna share, but I know we are also thinking about for SEMI 2.0, a podcast. So there'll be a lot of things I think to come. Um, and if you continue to engage with us, we're, we're, we'll be sending things out. Um, and also, sorry, I'm talking a lot and want to make sure Wendy and Tony can also share if there's things you want to say, but I also wanted to share, we do have a couple of learning opportunities coming up. We have a series for faculty. Um, we have a series for practitioners working with um, in centers. We also have a series on um, for practitioners who, or for early intervention practitioners who might be coaching families or coaching um, childcare providers or, or other um, center-based practitioners. And so there, there are some learning opportunities that are coming up and I'll put that in the chat for us to send out, um, but you can engage with us throughout that. We're calling that our STEMI Fest series throughout the um, upcoming, throughout the rest of this year, I guess. I'll just jump in and say a little bit about the podcast idea that we're going to be jointly working on again. And the idea is once again, it's not going to be just so much for the child as for the family together so that the child is learning something about science and the parents are really learning how do I work with my child with STEM? How do I incorporate this throughout my day? And we're looking at them being very short because these are young children, families are busy. It's something they can listen to while they're in the car or while they're cooking dinner together. Um, so I think that's something I'm really excited to see how that that develops as we move forward. Um, and I just wanted to to briefly respond to James's comment about um, with the app and children learning how you best learn. And I think you're right. I think that's a side effect of this app is that kids can learn you know, these are the adaptations that I need and they and their parents can learn, oh, maybe I should go look at that settings button and everything that I do online and see, is there something I can change, even if it wasn't intentionally designed to be universal, universally acceptable. Here's a, a tool that I have that might help me make it more accessible. Yeah, I, I don't Tony, know. Go about ahead. I was going to say, I don't, this is Tony, I don't know about future work for STEMI, but I do appreciate that the STEMI resources are always thought of with busy families and teachers in mind, because you probably didn't see it in the video, but I had to print out some of those resources because um, they were still working on some of them. And it was accessible to me, but I don't think it would have been accessible to all families. Um, and just, I love how they are considering what families need to, to have to be embedded into their daily life and routines because we don't all have the time and luxury to print out activities and to find and all the resources we need. We just need something. What can I do right now with my kids? I was thinking of that too as a former teacher. I used to have to struggle with my lesson plans while having toys and activities that kids are playing with, right? And meanwhile, having um, either the iPad nearby or a phone nearby to just quickly click something and to walk through is a lot easier and takes less, um, you know, actually, and also, like you said, it's very accessible. I really um, was also curious, uh, Wendy, if you could share what made the decision to add the second language on there, because that adds and taps into a whole different population of people and children and families that may not uh, have access to this. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly the reason behind it. Um, the folks at STEMI said, 
we want to add Spanish. And we said, great, we have a Spanish department. And so we learned so much. There were so many things we didn't expect to be so challenging because we had carefully developed our sentences to make it easy for kids to put the word in and it makes sense in the story. And all of a sudden in Spanish, that didn't work because the word order was different and we needed articles in front of things. And uh, we had gendered of the words to worry about, uh, but it was, so it was not a, an easy thing to do, but it was so helpful and is such a benefit because there are so many families that speak Spanish and we want them to be able to access this app and be able to use it and learn with it. And I saw, um, Megan, that you wanted to answer um, April's question. So I'll pass this back to you. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, and April, I, well, and I appreciate all the questions folks are putting in. Um, and April, I wanted to share, I saw that you were asking about um, science context, content standards for preschool age children. Um, and I did wanna say the learning trajectories that we've been developing are, um, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not gonna call them standards, but they are really looking at, we have a science area that is, um, what is it, what does STEM look like? You know, what are the developmental progressions? What are the big content areas? And then what are those activities that really support you that, that are really connected to the NG, the next generation science standards? We have um, connected, we have made sure that the STEMI work really connects to what comes later, because again, we know that there's a, lifespan, right? You know, you don't just end at five. So we tried to make sure that we are really thoughtful about thinking through. Um, and we've also done some other things I think really important to share. We didn't earlier, um, but we have done a look at all of the state's early learning guidelines to really ensure we understand what's happening around um, STEM in those early learning guidelines. And so there will be some things on our website um, coming soon that will help, that, will, that we will share what we found and also share um, like you're, I think, looking for what does STEM, what does STEM really look like, and science is a part of that as well. That's really great. I think we're going to wrap up now and share our last slide where people can find some more information. Um, I'm going to, in a minute, I'll get some links in the chat. Uh, Jessica, do you want to um, kind of close out some of this? Hi, yes, this is Jessica. Sorry, I got disconnected for a second. So glad that I'm able to be back in to close out with you all. But um, for our panelists and for all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed hearing from our panelists. We hope you all enjoyed learning about a great tool that you can incorporate into um, your students' teaching and learning. Um, you can uh, as has been mentioned before, you can find the recording of this webinar and the and some more information about STEMI on OET's website, um, OSEP's website, and STEMI's website. Um, please consider joining us for any future events that we have about educational technology and accessibility. Um, more information about those opportunities will be forthcoming. Um, we have some links here for learning more about OET's work as well. Um, I particularly want to highlight the Affordable Connectivity Program, um, which if you don't know about it, it is a federal communications commission program that provides a discount of up to $30 per month towards internet service for eligible households and up to $75 per month for households on qualifying tribal lands. Um, uh, students who receive free and reduced lunch also qualify. I think there's a, um, a lag in that, so I'll just finish closing that uh, you can find these links in the description below if you're watching the recording or in the chat. And there's also the o Office uh, of Special Education Programs, OSEPideasThatWork.org. I'll say that again, OSEPideasThatWork.org. Sorry, it was a little fast. Really want to thank the panelists today. Very much appreciate your sharing. And if anybody has any questions about this, feel free to reach out to one of our offices. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a great day.